Hello everybody, welcome back to English 332. In this lesson, we'll be covering chapter 8, Working and Writing in Teams. It's a very important topic. Uh, not a lot of students, uh, I think, enjoy the idea necessarily of doing a group project or collaborating with other students on writing projects, but nevertheless, uh, nevertheless it's a very, very important skill. It's a very marketable skill. It's something that just about every employer looks for in their hires. And I think uh, really reading this chapter, maybe even a couple of times and getting a handle on some of these uh, strategies for working in teams will go a lot further than just uh, being successful in this course or even in college. I think you'll find this stuff really useful for your career path. Uh, anyway, with that said, we've got a lot to cover, so let's get into this. All right, three dimensions of team interactions. Uh, think about when you're having a uh, a meeting with your team or a group meeting. Maybe you play sports and you have a uh, meeting sometimes with a coach and your fellow uh, teammates. Uh, there's basically three types of interactions or discussions you can have, topics, I guess. Uh, one is informational, and this is just the content <laughs> of that meeting. Uh, what problem are you there to try to talk about? Uh, have you collected data? It's basically just any kind of information, uh, content. Uh, the next one is procedures, uh, methods, uh, the process. Uh, this could be things like um, if you're forming a, a uh, forming a team, how will you decide on things? Or how many times will you meet per week? Where will you meet? Uh, what would be the process you'll use if somebody uh, disagrees? If, is it going to be a vote, flipping a coin, uh, that sort of thing? How will you collect your data? And then interpersonal. Uh, this would be things like icebreakers, just going around the room, introducing yourself to uh, the other people, uh, getting to know your teammates on a, I guess, kind of a personal or emotional level. Uh, so you can see how this one, it isn't really related to the procedure of the group uh, or the some kind of information uh, that the group is there to assemble, uh, but just about the, uh, the other people on the team. And these, all three of these are, will uh, be very important. All right, so now we can talk about the life stages of, of a team and its interactions, uh, the formation or when the group comes together, uh, the coordination or when they uh, do the work or whatever it is that, whatever the reason that team was, uh, that team had for coming together, uh, this step is the uh, actually doing the work. And then the formalization or the final stage where, again, depending on what the team's purpose is, if, if you have a committee that was put together to make a report, you know, this is where you would actually print out and submit that report. So just the final stage. Uh, but let's look at each of these in turn. So with formation, uh, the first one, uh, the first step is to begin to define the task. So I've been on a lot of different kinds of committees here at St. Cloud State. I was actually very surprised when I got to be a professor. I, I just assumed that most of it would be teaching. <laughs> Uh, that's just one one part of the job. A lot of the times, so a lot of my time is spent in various kinds of meetings with colleagues or deans or uh, uh, just interdisciplinary teams, groups. Uh, there's just all sorts of committee work that goes along with being a professor. And it's the same for just about any career field. And when these committees come together, usually the first order of business is to try to uh, figure out why, <laughs> why do we exist? <laughs> uh, what is the purpose of this committee? So it could be I'm on a committee this semester where we are putting together a, a new major called professional communication. And so that's the, the big task we're there to, to perform. Uh, but other committees I'm on, uh, there might be something like um, uh, campus and acad uh, academic technologies. Uh, so that's a committee that's the purpose of that committee is to figure out what kind of technologies are out there that might be useful, that might, might want to bring to St. Cloud State or uh, ways to better use the ones we've got already. And so those are just the tasks. Uh, once you've figured that out, you know, the next step would be social cohesiveness, trying to get to know the other people on the team. Uh, usually this will be, uh, just we'll just go around the room, the table, right? And hi, I'm, I'm Matt Barton from the English department. <laughs> and so it could be that basic. If it's a team that's going to be around for a long time though, they might have uh, go out for beers. <laughs> Don't ever do that at a, 
uh, St. Cloud committees, but you know, certainly in a business scenario, you might go out for drinks. Uh, you might have uh, go out for coffee, lunch, uh, just anything that's beyond just the business at hand, right? The, the point of this one is to get to know those other people on the team. Uh, setting up and clarifying procedures. Uh, so again, with these committees, some of the committees I'm on are very formal. They use Robert's Rules of Order. So you have, uh, you know, somebody has to make a motion and second the motion, and there's formal agendas and minutes. It's a very formal uh, team. Uh, other times, though, it's very relaxed, informal. There's really not much in the way of procedures. And sometimes that can be a problem if something comes up like a, a disagreement or we need to hurry up and get something done. Uh, how do we do that? Or it could just be simply uh, setting up a time and a place to meet every week. Uh, ground rules. You know, again, this will vary tremendously depending on the type of team we're talking about. Uh, I can imagine some teams might have uh, rules about attendance and what happens if you don't <laughs> come to the meeting or you keep miss if you miss enough meetings, maybe you get uh, fired from that committee. Uh, just any kind of thing that uh, might come up. If you make a rule in advance, it's easier to enforce that than if you just uh, try to deal with it as problems arise. Uh, using interpersonal communication to resolve tensions. Uh, so I would say this, this sort of goes with the second one. You know, we mentioned icebreakers. Uh, sometimes if the group is brand new and people don't know each other very well, they can be nervous and not get a lot done because they're kind of anxious about <laughs> talking. Uh, so there's all sorts of icebreakers you can do. Uh, some people, uh, maybe they'll tell a little joke, right, to get people kind of laughing. <laughs> they'll bring in uh, some cookies or brownies or donuts or something. Uh, again, just anything to get beyond that uh, sort of ice, uh, that icy tension that you feel when you're brand new to a team. And then uh, finally, analyzing the problem uh, well before seeking solutions to it. Uh, a lot of times uh, people don't really have a good grasp of what, what is the problem that we're here to solve? What exactly is that problem? And the classic example was a building with elevators, uh, you know, big tall skyscraper. And the uh, problem was that people were complaining that the elevator was taking too long you know, they only had this one elevator and it took a long time for it to come down and pick you up and take you to where you needed to go. And so some of the solutions might have been, well, let's put in another elevator, right? Or let's find a way to speed this one up so it goes a lot faster. Uh, but when they really analyzed the problem, well, they figured out that the, really what the problem was that people were complaining, right? People were unhappy. That was really the problem. Uh, so they were able to solve it by putting in mirrors around that around the elevator and then people could uh, sort of primp I guess or check themselves out in these mirrors <laughs> as they were waiting. I gave them something to do and they weren't bored and it, they quit complaining. So that was an easy way to solve the problem, a lot cheaper than putting in a new elevator. All right, that brings us to the coordination phase which I mentioned earlier. This is where you're actually doing the work. It is of course the longest phase. And they're talking here specifically, I think, about uh, the type of discussions you would have as, as you go to these meetings. And they say most of the comments or mostly what needs to be said is informational. So something about the content of that problem, data, more information about the problem, uh, observations, survey results, uh, ideas for solutions, uh, uh, that sort of thing. You're worried about the problem itself. Uh, however, uh, as you know, if you've been on in a group, and I'm sure you have, uh, sooner or later there will be a conflict. If you maybe somebody says with that earlier example, look, we just need to put in another elevator, and somebody else says, well, let's just put in a mirror, <laughs> and the first person might say, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, uh, and then you got this conflict. So what do you do? Well, that's when you come back to this uh, interpersonal or the procedural comments. Uh, so this would be referenced back to, if you know the person well uh, through interpersonal skills, and you might be able to, uh, to talk them down that way and say, hey, that's not very nice. Uh, you know, you, <laughs> you, you, wouldn't, you remember when you told me about uh, when somebody said something like that to you and uh, you didn't like it, so why are you doing that to me now? Uh, you know, something like that. And that's only possible if you know the person well, right? Uh, but more likely you would use the second option. Uh, 
maybe earlier you decided that the procedure would be if there is a disagreement, we would vote on it and we would just whatever the uh, result of that vote was, that's what we would go with. Or maybe it was just we'll flip a coin if that happens. Uh, but it's some reference coming back again to procedures. And if with those uh, real formal groups, this would be coming back to the Roberts rules of order again. So somebody might say you're you're out of order or nobody declared a motion. Uh, you can't talk about that. And then uh, finally, considering many different solutions. Uh, so somebody's making out like there's only two solutions and you're kind of butting heads on that. Uh, maybe you could come up with some additional solutions to put them on the table, kind of diffuse uh, the conflict that way. And then we get to that last stage, the formalization. Uh, they talk about a consensus state here. Uh, so this would be that everybody on the team more or less agrees that it's, it's a good solution. Um, they're able to, the people that have real disagreements are able to swallow that, I guess, and not keep objecting. And then the team implements the decisions and that will determine the, the success of that project, right? So uh, if the if this campus technology team comes to a consensus and we all say that we all agree that we need to say update D2L, it's going to cost a lot of money to do that maybe, but we, we all agree that it's important. Well, that'll probably get implemented uh, because that team is uh, how to say the consensus. So how do you get to that consensus? Well, you need to forget the earlier conflicts. So maybe earlier on somebody was saying, look, we don't need to upgrade D2L. It's, it's fine as it is. You know, and maybe they got hung up on that for a while. Uh, but the problem is if they keep, if they won't let it go, uh, then they won't reach a consensus state. And then the results of this teamwork will be very wishy-washy or uh, not really forceful. And it probably won't get up, the, the software probably won't get updated, right? Now, what if you're on a team? Uh, what are the positive, positive roles you can play, the task goals? Uh, one is to just simply seek information, uh, opinions. So coming back to that uh, hotel scenario, maybe you uh, uh, seek information from uh, the customers or the, the guests at the hotel, right? Maybe just ask them about it, have some conversations, or you talk to the staff. Uh, maybe you look at what other hotels are doing, uh, but you're just seeking information. And then the corollary to that is to give the information, right? So you, you found out some stuff, now you share it with your team or you share your opinion on it. And you evaluate it. You coordinate with other people on that team. Or you can summarize. And we'll talk about these other ones here in a minute. Uh, so here's some positive actions that you can use. Uh, or that you can perform, I guess, on a team. One is to encourage participation. So what happens most of the time in a group project or these on a committee, you usually have a couple of people that are really active, uh, but other people are kind of quiet. Uh, they're not, um, you know, it's not that they're not engaged or that they're not listening, but maybe they just don't really feel encouraged to participate. Uh, so this step could be something like, if you notice somebody in your group hasn't talked for a while, uh, say, hey, you know, Matt, I <laughs> haven't heard from you in a while. What, what are your thoughts? Uh, something like that just to get them back into the loop. Uh, secondly, relieving tensions. So this could be a little joke or uh, maybe you tell a little personal story or an anecdote. Uh, just something to, again, if people are getting worried or upset or they're anxious about something, uh, they can sort of clam up. Uh, so relieving the tension is a good positive thing you can do. Uh, checking the feelings. It's a, I, I, as a teacher, I do this all the time. I'll ask my class, how's everybody doing? Is, is everybody okay? <laughs> is anybody uh, confused? Uh, I guess people don't really get angry in my classes, but if I saw somebody that looked like they were really, um, you know, I'm, I'm checking the body language, right? And if I see somebody who looks like they're really upset about something, I might uh, ask them if everything's all right. Uh, solving interpersonal problems. So sometimes, uh, if, let's say if you have this group of three people, maybe two people aren't getting along. Uh, sometimes as a third person, uh, you can step in there and, and help them uh, resolve their difficulties. Uh, and it's really kind of one of the things to keep in mind, especially in the business world. Uh, you don't necessarily have to be good friends, good chums, 
uh, to get stuff done, right? You, you just have to <laughs> be able to uh, be on a team and not snap at each other to maintain a certain level of professionalism. Uh, that's really the goal. Uh, listening actively is another huge one. I often, th you know, people often say, "Well, we're <laughs> we're born with uh, one mouth and two ears for a reason, right? You're supposed to listen twice as much as you talk." I think that's pretty good advice. Um, a lot of the times when people feel disrespected or disengaged, it's because they feel like people aren't listening to to them. Uh, so you really want to pay attention uh, when people talk. You know, if you ask somebody their opinion, uh, don't just ask them that with the intent of of uh, you know, attacking the opinion or refuting it. Uh, instead, you really want to listen carefully, consider it, and let them know that you're doing that, and they will like you a lot better, and the team will get more stuff done. All right, here's some negative things. This is stuff you don't want to do or see on your team. Uh, one is blocking. So this one is when you just don't like the idea or you don't like the purpose that that team was put together for you're really opposed to the solution they're offering uh, so you just kind of put your arms uh, you know cross your arms and refuse to, to go further you're going to do whatever you can to block any progress <laughs> uh, obviously you don't want that uh, dominating is when you sort of t assume leadership of a committee or a team but but not in a good way not because anybody needed you to do that or wanted you to do that but you're basically just bossy Start bossing people around, even though you don't have the authority to do so. And uh, that can intimidate people or frustrate people. And that's just negative. Uh, clowning around, obviously. we Well, it's good to tell a joke occasionally and keep things uh, from getting too tense. But you, could, you can get carried away with that and just kind of get everybody off topic by joking around too much. And that's just another negative thing. This is uh, the over speaking here is the one that I think is probably the most common. So you've probably been in groups with your classmates, maybe, or at your at your job if you work, and there's just somebody that's over talkative. <laughs> they feel like they have to say something anytime there's a pause. Uh, they have to respond to everything that's said. And again, uh, nobody wants them to do that. Everybody just wants them to to be quiet and let some other people talk. Uh, but they either not aware of it. Or they're just, they, <laughs> sometimes they just don't know what the deal is. Uh, so sometimes you just have to tell them to, uh, please stop talking so much. Let other people get a word in. Uh, so that's another thing to be aware of. Make sure you're not doing it. And withdrawing, uh, this simply means, probably as a result of one of these four here, uh, you feel like people aren't really listening to you or that your input is not valued or wanted or you're not, enough you don't have enough expertise to contribute uh, whatever the problem is and you'll just simply uh, be quiet clam up maybe not even really pay attention to what the, the group is saying uh, so that's another problem and you don't want to withdraw uh, you want to find a more productive way uh, to deal with these negative actions uh, now we're talking about team leadership and these they come back to those three types of interactions we talked about before. So you could think about this as three different kinds of leaders on a team. Uh, the first, again, is this informational. So somebody that's really dealing with the content. Uh, maybe they're working on creating or writing. Uh, another type of leadership is interpersonal. So somebody there that's really focused on the other the people on the team. You know, how are they feeling? Uh, helping you deal with conflicts, monitoring uh, the process. And then lastly, the procedural person or procedural leadership would be things like making sure that you have an agenda for the meeting, uh, making sure that the different people on that team know what's going on, uh, checking up on people, making sure they're getting their part of the job done. Do they need something? Uh, getting it to them, that sort of thing. And the key here is, is to think that not to think that you just need to have one for each of these roles or one person needs to do all of this. Uh, but rather to divvy up this stuff as it makes sense. I always find that some people are better at one or more of these. Some people might be great with the interpersonal stuff, but they're not really very well organized enough to be a procedural person. Uh, so that's coming back to this idea of knowing your team. If you know your teammates really well, then you will know which ones would be better for these different roles. 
and really they should just step in and, and fill in uh, when, when they're needed. Now what if you do have a problem with your team or your team has not encountered some difficulties? The book is going to go over two different ways, two different strategies. So one is a seven-step process and the other one's called the DOT uh, strategy. But we'll look at this first, the uh, seven-step process first. Uh, one is to make sure that we have identified uh, the actual problem. Uh, it sounds like this is easy, but sometimes people could be yelling at each other and you're wondering, what, what's the problem here? And they really don't know. <laughs> or it might turn out that they're really not even disagreeing. They just, it was a miscommunication or something. And so the first step might be just, let's get clear about what we're actually disagreeing about. Uh, the second step would be to understand what does the team have to deliver. And so sometimes a team will get, a teammate might get really worked up about something and the stuff they're worried about really is not even all that important, right? Maybe you say, well, look, all we need to do here is make a, a PowerPoint. <laughs> you know, we don't necessarily have to solve all the problems at this point. Uh, we're just making a PowerPoint to lay out um, our report. Or uh, let's think of some other uh, examples, right? So if you know, if, you, if you're going to, if you submit a eight page report, or that's a lot different than submitting a, a whole book on the topic, or if, you, if you're going to need uh, color posters or whatever. Uh, so the point here is what do you actually need to get done? And let's just stay focused on that and not get carried away uh, with stuff that's not even really our responsibility. Uh, so what form is it going to be in and uh, when will it be due? Uh, so I don't want to, we have a whole section in this PowerPoint about student work, but uh, just to jump ahead to that, you know, if you know what form it needs to be in, if it's going to be a report, how long is it going to be, how many words, etc., uh, that will help you uh, with the second step. Uh, but also knowing when it's due and factoring that in, you know, if you have a week to work on something, you have to work quickly. If you have a couple of months, you know, you can uh, take more time and, and build in more time for a proofreading and things. So really having a good grasp of number two will help with most problems. You know, if, if it's due, really, if it's due tomorrow, uh, you can just say, look, you know, I know you uh, folks are having a big disagreement over there, but <laughs> this thing is due tomorrow. It only needs to be a couple of pages. Let's just uh, move past this. Uh, gathering information. And uh, again, it's, it's not good for just one person to know everything. Uh, they have to. If you learn something, you need to share it with your teammates, but you also have to examine it critically, uh, especially with student projects, or I guess any kind of business scenario. Uh, somebody might come to the group with a bunch of information and, and they say, I've done some research on this and here's what I found out. And it sounds good, but then you say, well, where did you get that information from, right? And you find out they just went to <laughs> Google and it's kind of questionable website uh, where that information came from. Uh, so that's uh, the third step. You know, maybe if their information is no good, uh, then that will uh, solve the problem. You can just say, well, we don't even need to factor that in because that information is erroneous. Uh, the fourth step, uh, the fourth step is to establish criteria. So with our criteria just means standards of judgment or evaluation. And so instead of just saying that's a good idea or that's a bad idea, uh, you could say, let's talk about how the cost of that idea or the costs. Let's talk about how long it would take to implement. Uh, let's talk about legal issues. Uh, so you come up with three or four different categories or criteria, and then you can weigh those. Uh, the fifth step is to generate alternative solutions. Uh, so again, if you've got two people that are saying, look, I like this idea, and this other person says, no, I like this other idea better, uh, sometimes the way past that is to come up with some additional solutions, right? So maybe there's some a third idea uh, that they'll both like and you can get past that, uh, that impasse. And then the sixth step would be simply to go back to your uh, criteria and number them, you know, figure out which one of these is number one, which is number two. And then uh, within that, uh, you could say this one gets a, well, let's just say it was cost, right? So the mirrors might cost a couple thousand dollars uh, another elevator might cost a million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars. I'm not really sure how much elevators cost, but I'm pretty sure it's more than a mirror. <laughs> uh, so if you say that uh, cost is your number one criteria, and then you find out that one is 
drastically cheaper, well, that might uh, resolve the problem. You know, it's pretty clear which one will be cheaper, uh, so you can move on that way. And choosing the best solution. So the seventh one is important to keep in mind. Uh, sometimes none of the solutions are perfect. You know, there's not like just one right answer. Uh, maybe none of the solutions are all that great, really, uh, but you have to choose one. And so it's more important to choose the best one uh, than just to go away and, and not be able to agree or not to be able to come to any kind of consensus. Now, the other way to, to make decisions is called dot planning. And this is what I'm less familiar with. I was kind of intrigued by it, though. And it's really set up for uh, large teams. So you probably wouldn't do this with just two or three group mates or group members in a class. But you know, let's just say you're working on a big piece of software and you might have a, a, you know, a couple dozen programmers, designers, writers. You know, It could be a very big team. And when you have all those people, you have to have a way to keep them organized, uh, keep the uh, priorities straight. Uh, so that's what this dot planning is all about. Uh, the team brainstorms ideas. So you have a, a meeting, you got everybody there, and you might say, let's just all brainstorm some things that we think need to get done on the project. And so you come up quickly. You got a lot of people, so you get a bunch of these ideas quickly. And somebody's recording them on uh, large pages, and they put them on large pages because the idea is they'll be pasted up around the room, right? So people can walk past them and uh, put their stickers on there. Uh, so, yeah, so they post them on the wall. And then you have these little dots, and I'll show you them there. <laughs> and so you could have uh, different colors uh, for high priority, or if you think it's a low priority. And then you just, everybody goes around and sticks their stickers wherever, on whatever ideas they think are high and low. And it's very visible. It's kind of a visual way to think, too. And so it's, it's easy to see uh, what people think are high priority. And, and I think maybe sometimes just putting these stickers on things is a little less it kind of makes you kind of not so nervous about doing that as you would be, say, uh, openly disagreeing with somebody or arguing uh, with somebody. A lot of people don't like that. They don't they don't want to be oppositional. They don't they don't want conflict. It's not a lot of conflict just to go over there and put a little sticker on next to a an idea. Right. So I think that's the strength of this dot planning. All right, so the feedback strategy, now this is another great thing about uh, teamwork, is being able to get feedback on the ideas from that team. If you have ideas coming from outside, uh, that can influence the team, help you get to a better decision. So the first step, of course, is just to generate the feedback. So think about a restaurant and how they will sometimes have a uh, customer satisfaction survey. Or if you go to get some car work done, they'll usually, or if you buy a car, they'll have a, uh, a phone survey or internet survey. And they're trying to get feedback on whether they did a good job, right? Now, of course, that's useless unless you actually heed the feedback. You have to listen to it. It might not be what you want to hear. Uh, but if you want to stay in business, you really have to pay attention to this. And so where can you get it? Uh, they talk about external sources. You know, maybe the supervisor, like for this committee, maybe I go to the chair, the dean, uh, I guess maybe even the uh, the president of the university, uh, or different types of businesses. Maybe talk to the suppliers, uh, get some of their uh, ideas on this. Uh, sometimes uh, with the teaching scenario, if it's something involving teaching, right, you might talk to the people that make the various software. Maybe talk to textbook publishers. Uh, they're kind of suppliers. Of course, clients and customers are, in my case, uh, students. So if I'm trying out a new software, I might ask my class, you know, what, what, what do you think about this new tool? Uh, do you like Edpuzzle, uh, etc.? cetera? That'd be external feedback. And then the internal, of course, is just within that team. Uh, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess that's pretty clear what that means, right? <laughs> just what does the rest of your team think about it? And now that brings us to student teams. And again, a lot of times I ask students uh, what they think about group projects, and they say they don't like them, and they're not very successful. They'd rather work alone. And that's fine. You know, I get it. But, uh, you know, again, what the employer wants is people that can work well with others. 
And it's not that hard. I will say this. I think it is harder to work on a team uh, than it is just to work by yourself. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, there's not many jobs where you're just kind of sitting in a room doing everything on your own. Uh, if you want to get paid, you have to <laughs> learn how to work <laughs> as a team. And these student teams, it's a great place to learn some of these skills. So let's go over some of these steps. And also want to get your feedback on these as we go along, uh, see what your experience has been like. Um, but anyway, the first one is to assign a specific task. So if it's a, uh, like this uh, PowerPoint presentation we've been talking about, maybe you say, John, I want you to find five really good images uh, to use in the PowerPoint. And, and Tom, I want you to come up with text for uh, slides one and two. And meanwhile, I will uh, be uh, working on uh, the research uh, for the slide number four or five, what, you know, whatever it is, everybody knows exactly what it is they're supposed to be working on. Uh, that's really the, it's really, really key. Uh, a lot of groups fall down or they don't work well because when people get home, they don't really know what, what they're supposed to be working on. So they don't do anything or they do, uh, they end up doing the same thing as another group member. And then you got a uh, redundancy. Uh, making sure people are clear about deadlines is another key thing. If I just, if I tell, uh, who is it, Tom, to do some, come up with some text for slides one and two, and I don't tell him when I need that, he might just assume it's okay to wait till next week. You know, and then we've got a big problem and we have to play catch up. So that's bad. Uh, scheduling frequent meetings. Again, this will really help. And the problem here, of course, is that with the, uh, you know, with a student group, it's not like it used to be where everybody was just in the dorms and it was really easy to meet up outside of class. Uh, now you've got people working. They might have a, you know, a couple of kids at home, right? And they've got to work around the, the school schedule or, or, or daycare or whatever. Uh, so this can be really difficult and you shouldn't uh, underestimate uh, that step. Uh, so you just really have to work with your team, figure out when when's a good time to meet. Uh, it's, it's better to meet in person some, most of the time, but if you can't, uh, you might have to resort to a Skype. We'll talk some more, more about some of those tools here in a minute. Uh, meet and talk through plans and conflicts uh, face to face. Uh, so usually, you know, again, sometimes you can't meet face to face. I work with a lot of teams and my other teammate might be in a different state or, or even a, di a different country even. Uh, but nevertheless, when we're just getting off the ground with this project, I'll usually call, we'll have a phone call about it because it's really easy to, uh, you know, quickly come up and dismiss ideas over the phone uh, than it would be to be emailing back and forth or, or something like that. And so that's really important during the planning phase. And of course, if you have a conflict with somebody, you know, usually this is a, a miscommunication, right? You, you got this email from somebody, you feel like the tone is not right, you, you kind of feel insulted by it, uh, you get angry about it. And it could just be that person that's just not good at expressing him or herself over email. Uh, but if you pick up a phone and call them or you go see them, uh, then a lot of the times all that kind of diffuses and you realize it was uh, it really was nothing and you can get back uh, to work. Uh, building trust through goodwill, listening uh, and participation. You know, if you if, if people on your team feel like you're a really good team member, that you really listen, you're respectful, uh, you like to participate, uh, they will be a lot more likely to listen to you, right? And they, they'll want to do a good job <laughs> because they know you're working hard too. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a contagion. It's kind of contagious, right? So I, I like this third point here a lot too. Uh, recognizing contributions. Uh, a lot of times you have a group and the group member one of the group members feels like they're not really valued or they're not really part of the group or nobody really cares what they think. Uh, so it's really important to, uh, again, build that trust. You know, make sure that person knows that you do listen to them, that you do want them to participate, uh, that you do have their best interest <laughs> at heart too. Uh, and kind of, you know, especially with somebody who's kind of with, with, withdrawing, like we talked about before, if you can really reach out to those people and, when they do come up with an idea, uh, make sure you recognize that, thank them for their contribution. Even if you don't end up using it, a lot of times they'll be happy just knowing you really considered it. A couple more points on this. 
uh, listening listening carefully to each other. Uh, sometimes with a group you'll find, uh, well, some of those other problems we talked about, the, the over-talkers, the, the dominator type, uh, they're not really listening to what other people have to say. You know, they've got their idea of how things should be, and they don't really care uh, that you think it should be done differently. So that's not productive. Uh, what, they, what they should do instead is really just listen to what everybody else says. Uh, even if you think the idea is crap, uh, you, don't, you don't want the person to know that. Uh, just listen uh, to it and consider it, and that will go a long way towards building that cohesion. Again, it's not that you have to agree with what everybody says. Uh, that's not really the point. Uh, the point is that you listen, you understand, and you value uh, their contribution, even if you don't end up using it. Uh, proportionate workloads, this is basically just a fancy way to say, uh, be fair. <laughs> you don't, don't have one person doing all the heavy lifting. Uh, make sure that everybody puts in a, chips in an equal amount. You know, it's, it's hard to be exact, especially if you have a situation where maybe two of the group members are local and they can get together all the time, but this other person might be a commuter student from the cities and it just simply won't be available uh, for a lot of these meetings. Uh, so you have to work around that. Uh, it's not fair just because that person commutes you know, that's fine. You still have to try to find ways for them to contribute equally uh, so the other group members don't feel like they're uh, doing all the work. Uh, making decisions together, another key step. Now, this is another reason why you want to have those frequent meetings and make sure that everybody's there because it's really upsetting. You know, imagine this commuter student comes back to class and finds out you've uh, decided to change the topic of the book, uh, didn't consult her, uh, him or her, and she's, uh, you know, so that's kind of upsetting, right? So you didn't include the, uh, this person in that decision. And so that's really bad to do that. So make sure everybody's consulted, give them time to re respond. Uh, listen to criticism. I know how hard that can be, <laughs> uh, especially if it's some, coming from your team. A lot of, you know, what I find really is a lot of this comes down to egos. So somebody feels like, uh, I'm such a great writer. I just, I'm such a good student and this person's a slacker or, or this person doesn't know uh, what he's talking about. And so you tend to just not even listen uh, to what that person is saying. Uh, well, really, in that case, you, you kind of have to put that ego in check. You just have to take, take a deep breath, uh, whatever, be a little more humble, uh, practice humility. Uh, just listen to what they have to say and consider it. Even if it's not what you want to hear, consider it. And I think really that that's really what makes somebody intelligent, I think, is, is when they are willing to listen to what other people have to say. Uh, it's just somebody that feels like they know it all. They, they probably, they probably pre actually pretty dumb when you get down to it. All right, uh, dealing directly with conflicts. Uh, so if, if there is somebody that feels alienated or they get angry, uh, don't go around that person's back. Uh, sometimes what happens in my classes, one of the students in a group uh, won't do their part of the job or they they just don't show up to meetings or whatever. Uh, so the rest of the team, they'll come to me. Uh, they'll say, Dr. Barton, uh, you know, what, what do we do? Uh, this, this student's not doing anything. I don't think they deserve uh, a good grade on the project. <laughs> and I always say, why are you talk, talking to me about it? Uh, you should talk to your, your group member and contact them to keep it between, uh, you know, deal with that person um, I guess if they just never come back, um, that's, you know, we can solve that later. But try your best to deal directly with the person. Don't go behind their back. Here's a couple of interesting concepts, uh, peer pressure and group think. Uh, so these are some problems that groups get into, and the, and the book gives you lots of examples of the, the bad stuff that can happen when you fall prey to these things. Uh, one is they call it here group think. You know, I've heard this, uh, people call this the herd, herd mentality or sheeple. <laughs> uh, it's just people that they don't, they want to get along, right? And that's what they care about, just everybody getting along. And they don't like disagreement. And they really don't want to hear uh, negative feedback. So you could imagine a restaurant and they, and that team, they feel like they're just doing a perfect job. And even though customers are saying, hey, look, there's a problem here. We really don't like this. They don't even listen to that. They just assume those people are uh, idiots. And so that's groupthink. How can you correct it, though? 
Uh, search for alternatives, uh, test assumptions, and protect the rights of individuals to uh, disagree. Uh, sometimes with this one, you can do stuff anonymously. That's uh, so what I find in my classes sometimes. If I if I just said, hey, let me see your hands if you uh, found this lecture uh, exciting, let's say, or if you uh, let me raise your hand if you're confused about something. Uh, well, nobody wants to raise their hand uh, because that will just uh, drag the class out longer, <laughs> right? Or <laughs> they don't want to look uh, like they weren't paying attention or they don't want to seem like they're uh, dumb or something. And so I have to have a way for them to uh, disagree without uh, getting into trouble with their classmates or, or looking bad. And these other ones here make sense too, right? So if we think we've got the perfect solution, hey, maybe have somebody play devil's advocate. Just come up with some different ideas. Uh, or maybe uh, like those surveys we talked about with the restaurants, right? So maybe this group thinks they got a really great menu, but when they test it out, they find <laughs> there's some problems. All right, so having that outside opinion uh, can help. Now, what about our diverse team? And this is what the employers really love. <laughs> you know, it's, it's one thing to be a good team player, but it's even better if you can show that you can be a good team player, even if the other people on that team are, are really different than, than you. Right, so if you're working with students from other countries, different languages, uh, different cultures, uh, this is a great thing. It's just a tremendous skill uh, to have, but it will take some uh, work to get uh, to a point where you can be good at this. So uh, let's say we got a difference, all kinds of differences. Uh, we could have a team that's, uh, you got some guys and some gals on, on the team uh, or uh, LGBT uh, classmates, right? So you could have a really diverse uh, team in terms of gender, uh, class, uh, what kind of background, economic background, of course, race, ethnicity, a age is kind of an interesting one. Uh, sometimes I have uh, PSEO students, uh, so you might have, say, a 16-year-old in the class, and maybe another student in there might be a, uh, a non-traditional student, might be retire a retiree. You know, they might be 60-something or 70 years old, and they're working. They're on a team with a 16-year-old. <laughs> so uh, that can be a lot of fun, and it can be very productive, but it's it's certainly uh, they're, they're very different people. Of course, religion, uh, sexual orientation, uh, uh, physical abilities. So these are just some. I bet you could probably even come up with more ways uh, that a team can be diverse. Uh, but the, uh, the, the key here is not to see these differences as being bad or, or wishing that you just had everybody be identical. You know, that wouldn't be good. Uh, instead, finding ways to leverage uh, difference and get the most out of the diversity um, it's, if nothing else, it's really good for uh, solutions that are outside the box. Yeah, playing to one another's strengths. Uh, this is a big one. Uh, some people are really good at being visual. You know, they, they do really good image work. Uh, they've got a very nice eye for design. Uh, somebody else might be a really good speaker. Uh, they're, they're not shy at all about public speaking. They can really get out in front of a crowd and, and do well. Uh, somebody else might be a great writer. You know, so the uh, the idea there is you don't you don't want everybody everybody to be identical. <laughs> you just need to find out well what are you good at, what are you good at, or what do you really struggle with, and see if you can um, you know find a way to uh, <laughs> to design your team, I guess, or your procedures so that you get the best out of that group. Well, so here's some more information about ways to resolve conflict. Uh, one is to make sure the people that are in conflict actually do disagree with each other. Uh, it could just be that they misunderstand each other and they're not interpreting what the other person said correctly. Uh, make sure that everyone has correct information, right? So sometimes people like coming back to this D2L problem. Maybe somebody keeps saying, look, we can't update D2L. It's going to cost too much and come to find out they have been told it's going to cost a lot more than it actually is going to cost. And so that, that something like that, if you could figure out what their information is and figure out that it's wrong and correct it, you know, the conflict might go away. Uh, discovering the needs each person is trying to meet. Uh, again, sometimes, actually this uh, campus technology is a good example. 
because uh, I might have a colleague from, say, a math department, another colleague from uh, accounting, and maybe somebody else's biology, somebody else's marketing. Uh, so they're all going to need uh, D2L to do different things, right? They, for, you know, the math professor uh, might need to be able to input formulas uh, into uh, <laughs> text boxes. I, it's kind of making stuff up here. Uh, but that wouldn't really matter to me as an, as an English professor. Uh, so what, the key, though, is to find out what is each person, you know, how are, what are their needs? Uh, what are they trying to do with this? And that can be a way to resolve a conflict. Maybe if the math professor's objections are that there's no good way to put in those formulas, uh, once the team knows that, uh, maybe we could go to D2L and say, look, you know, we would update, but we need this formula capability and we could get it resolved that way. Uh, searching for alternatives. Again, if, if it's a choice between A and B and, and people are divided on that, uh, sometimes the, idea, the best way to do it is just say, well, here's a third option. Uh, repairing negative feelings. Uh, it's amazing how, <laughs> and I've been victim of this too, right? You, get, you go to a meeting, uh, you're part of a team, and right off the bat, somebody says something or you feel snubbed somehow. You, you, you just feel embarrassed, maybe humiliated. And you just kind of bunch up and you, you clam up and you, you don't really want to participate at all. And that can linger on and on and on. And sometimes they never get repaired, uh, which is sad. It would be nice if the person, <laughs> you know, if the other team could recognize this and find a way to deal with the negative feelings. Uh, sometimes it's just in the way you phrase things. And I, I just got to the point in my life where I'm quick to, if I feel like I've offended somebody, I just go ahead and apologize. <laughs> I feel like I'm better off apologizing. Uh, even if they're not really upset, that's better than not apologizing and just letting those uh, ill feelings uh, culminate and increase. So if I see somebody that I feel like is, uh, you know, if you if you have a group member there and you feel like they're upset, you know, if, you, if there's some way you can get them either apologize or make it up to them somehow, uh, try to avoid being disrespectful in the first place. But uh, the point is, if the damage has been done, maybe there's some way to repair it, and that's better than just ignoring it. Uh, criticism uh, responses. So somebody's criticized you, let's say. <laughs> but how do you deal with it? <laughs> there, nobody likes it, but you yeah, kind of have to deal with it. Uh, one is, and this is uh, something I've heard Many times I have students that take uh, or that work in customer service and they, they talk about this. So somebody calls up customer service, Husky help desk or whatever. They're complaining about something, criticizing it. Uh, one of the things the person can do is to paraphrase it. And so what you do is say, OK, let me I hear what you're saying. Uh, let me just see if I can put this into my own words or, or, or is this. Let me see if I got this straight. Right. And you sort of try to uh, say back to them in your words, what it is they're telling you. And this is good because it shows them that, one, that you do take it seriously, you are listening, you do understand the problem. And a lot of times that's really what, if they're emotional, that might be, that might diffuse the emotional part of it. And they feel like, okay, finally, somebody is actually listening. Uh, checking for feelings. Uh, sometimes this could be just as simply, I notice when I have a, a problem with a piece of software and I get on the one of these chats, technical support chats, or if I pick up the phone and call them, usually the first thing they'll ask is something like, how are you today? <laughs> how are you doing today? And that's just checking for feelings, right? If I say, oh, I'm fine. Thanks for asking. That's one response. If I said, oh, I'm, I'm really, <laughs> I'm frustrated. I'm, uh, I'm really angry. Uh, well, that's once they know that, they can respond in a different way. They might say, I'm sorry to hear that you're so upset. Uh, checking the inferences here. Uh, so what do you think, or what do you think that person is really, really means in that criticism? What's, what's the real problem uh, they're trying uh, to communicate? Uh, buying time with limited <laughs> agreement. Uh, sometimes the best thing to do is just wait for a person to cool off right? Uh, you don't want to keep escalating the conflict, going back and forth and just getting louder and louder. 
Uh, so if you feel like that's the situation, you can try to say, well, you know, I agree to a large extent with what you're saying. Uh, let's table it for now. Let's, we'll talk about it again later. You know, something like that might uh, give them a chance to cool off. Uh, using the uh, you attitude, uh, so this is looking at the criticism uh, from their point of view, but it uses I statements. And the example they give you here is, I feel that I'm doing more than my fair share of the work. So I guess if somebody says, hey, you're being lazy, you're not contributing, you're not participating, instead of saying, well, <laughs> screw you, <laughs> instead of getting mad about it, you could say, well, hey, look, I feel that I'm doing more than my fair share of the work. Uh, so they call it the you attitude there, but it's, I guess it should be the I attitude. Yeah, looking at things from others' viewpoints, uh, I statements are effective. All right, here's some notes about uh, meeting guidelines, uh, making the purpose of the meeting explicit, especially if somebody has to come a long way, from a long ways off and they've got a busy schedule. Uh, they don't want to go to a meeting that they feel like is useless or irrelevant. So making sure that everybody knows why you're meeting is important. Distributing an agenda, uh, have it basically a plan for the meeting. So you see, we're meeting today to work on the PowerPoint project. And I've, we've got an agenda here with five items that need to get done. Uh, time for discussion. I don't, this probably isn't that common, but if you have a big agenda, you might want to say, well, we'll spend an hour on this first step, uh, spend 10 minutes working on the second step, basically just uh, trying to estimate how long it's going to take. Uh, saving time with omnibus motions. So it might be that you've got a huge agenda. Let's say you've got 15 things you need to do, but maybe there's seven of those things that could just really rapidly be knocked out, sort of uh, routine editorial stuff. Uh, so you could just knock that all out at the beginning instead of uh, going through it step by step by step. Uh, paying attention to people and process as well as the tasks. Uh, so again, making sure that everybody's okay, that the, you're, you're obeying, that you're abiding by the right process. Uh, summarizing the group's consensus after each point. So what can happen here, especially in a big group, and you got lots of discussion, lots of opinions coming at you left and right. It might seem like everybody's on the same page, uh, but you really need to make sure, and you could do that simply by summarizing. So uh, you might you might have had teachers do this. They'll have a little group discussion, and then they'll uh, they'll write up on the board, sort of in their words, uh, what their view of what the class said there. And you know, kind of summarize everybody's opinion. And then you can do that again at the end of the meeting with all the decisions. So you could say, we, we've had a very productive meeting today. We've decided a number of things. Let me just quickly go over this. And then they'll just uh, give you a quick sort of mini report, I guess, of the uh, decisions. And that would give you a chance too to say, oops, <laughs> you got that wrong. Now, uh, some te te technology you can use in Teams. And we have quite, we have access to just about all of this. Uh, through St. Cloud State, and there's even some more uh, that they don't mention here. But these are the main ones that people use, and they got them broken up into categories. And I, I really think this is important because, um, not again, not everybody's on campus. And not every, there's very few people that actually live in the dorm these days and, and are on ca campus full time. Uh, people might be, even be in other countries. I got people taking uh, this course uh, that are serving uh, overseas in the military. You know, they can't just easily <laughs> show up to a face-to-face -face meeting, uh, right? So that's that's okay though, because there's these tools that are better than well, they're a lot better than nothing, and sometimes they're actually better than face-to-face -face meetings, in my opinion. Uh, but one of these is Skype, and that's a free one. Uh, I think you can pay a little money to get a premium version. Uh, but basically, it's a video chat. You can. Works similarly, uh, similar to a phone, but you can use your camera there so you can see each other. You can also share your screen, uh, which is nice. You want to show them what's on your screen. Uh, FaceTime, this is with iPhones. And I, I don't know what they, Google Plus, I think they probably mean Google Hangouts. Uh, that's just Google's version. I think they, I'm not sure what they call that one these days. Um, but 
Google's has has a couple of them. Uh, another one they don't mention here is Adobe Connect, I think it's called, and we have access to that one. Or D2L has various ways to meet. I don't know if it has video chat, but uh, there's ways to meet online. And this is a GoToMeeting. I haven't used this one myself, but I believe that one is also free. Uh, but I, th I think that's just another one of these sort of video conference chat systems. Uh, what's the one the gamers like to use? Uh, Twitch, I think. <laughs> you really have a lot of different options. Uh, and then scheduling software, online calendars, Outlook. Microsoft Outlook has a calendar you can share. Google has uh, shared calendars you can use. Uh, there's a service, different services out there you can use to try to schedule a meeting. I'm trying to think, what's the name of that? Uh, I'm blanking on the name. <laughs> but there's, oh, come on. It's going to drive me crazy. Uh, but there is software for, this is what happens a lot of times with me, is uh, I need to have a meeting with, say, four or five colleagues, and we've all got different teaching schedules. And it can be tricky to find a time when all five of us are available uh, for that meeting. Uh, so there's various free uh, programs you can use, web-based, and it'll basically just ask everybody, when are you available on Monday? When are you available on Tuesday? It asks everybody that. You check all the boxes when you're available, and then it will compile that, and it'll come back and say, this is the best time to meet uh, Friday at 2, something like that. Uh, project management. Uh, this is services like, uh, there's one called Trello that I know a lot of the computer science students use. And it's kind of this, it's almost like a poster board in a, on a website. So you can go there and you can post things, you can see tasks that are left to perform. And what's nice about this, it's very visual and you can, when you get something done, you can just check it and it'll go away and you can, you know, move on to the next, and the next phase. But you could do something similar just with the Google Doc, right? I mean, you don't necessarily need to get real fancy with it. Uh, but the idea is if you can take a big project, break it up into lots of chunks, and if, if there's a way that everybody can see what there is left to do, it, it makes it easy because let's just say uh, maybe Tanya here, uh, she's got a little time, maybe one of her classes got canceled. Uh, so she can hop on this Trello board, and that's T-R-E-L-L-O, and see, hey, there's a little task here. Uh, nobody's done yet. I think I could do that quick. Boom, you know, knock that one off. <laughs> you know, and uh, I, do, I really like this this sort of a Trello-like service. And then a collaboration. Oh, you got everything from Google Drive, wikis on that. Yeah, just, let's just bump into this collaborative writing one and talk about those. So you might have lots of writers working on the same document. So this could be a PowerPoint presentation, it could be a report, sometimes even an email, you know, a memo, just any time when you've got more than one writer working on a document. <clears throat> and so there's a lot of steps to this. Uh, we talked about this one already, that team formation process, when you get to know each other, you work out the procedures, uh, you decide, you lay out some ground rules, uh, you have ways to deal with conflict, and you have steps that you want to follow in that writing process, right? You, you probably want to have the familiar brainstorming, drafting, editing, revising, so you have all that laid out. Uh, it can be tricky to work with other writers. You know, a lot of us, we're, we're, we kind of like the way we write. <laughs> we might not like uh, other people's styles. Uh, so it's not like this is necessarily easy uh, to do. So a little thought up front, a little planning uh, can go a long ways towards uh, making this smoother. Um, know where you uh, agree and disagree uh, on your analysis. <laughs> Talking here, I guess, about planning. Uh, so you, have a, you might have a way that you want to write the book or do the PowerPoint, a plan. Uh, maybe somebody else's plan is a little different. So you want to figure out sort of uh, where you agree, where you disagree, can you work through it. Uh, planning the organization of the document, format and style before anyone writes. Uh, this is really a key. Uh, there's nothing worse than jumping into a collaborative project, doing a bunch of the writing, 
and then figuring out, hey, the rest of my team doesn't like this. They want to, they don't even like the, <laughs> they think I have the wrong style format. They just want to delete everything I've done and start over. That's very frustrating. So you don't want to just start writing uh, right away. Instead, you want to have a really clear vision, I guess, of the big picture. You know, how many slides are you going to have in this PowerPoint? Is it going to be formal, humorous? Uh, once you make those kinds of decisions, uh, then you can start to write. Uh, consider work styles and other commitments. Um, again, think about students these days and how busy they are. And we don't necessarily have the same big, huge blocks of time uh, to work on things together. So it's not that you can't work with somebody that's busy. Uh, you just have to find ways to work around their, their schedule. Uh, deciding how you will give feedback. <laughs> Now, this one can, can be really delicate sometimes. Uh, you don't want somebody to feel insulted or, again, that you don't value their contributions. Um, so, yeah, you have to be careful with this. Uh, maybe you want to give feedback periodically. Uh, or if it's a big enough team, I guess the feedback can be anonymous. You know, there's different ways to handle it. Uh, building leeway into the deadlines. Uh, this is a big one here because a lot of times students, uh, their big complaint about their group members, their group, is that nobody really did anything until the last minute. And then problems arose and the project didn't get done on time. So what you want to do is if the project is due, let's say, in 30 days, make sure that all everybody's deadlines is, is uh, 20 days, let's say. Uh, so that way, if somebody doesn't come through and they don't, they drop the ball, don't do their part of the project, you still got some time, you still got 10 days uh, to do something about it. Now, that's a lot better than waiting until the night before and then it's too late and you're just, you know, there's nothing to be done. When you get down to the actual composing of the writing phase, it's important to decide, of course, who's going to write what. Um, Google Drive or Google Docs makes it a little easier because you can see it in real time. Uh, but you don't want a situation where you, you, two people are writing the introduction, end up with two different introductions. And that's just redundancy. You know, they would have been better off uh, moving on to other sections. If it's a big book, you know, maybe you have somebody to do one chapter, somebody to do the other chapter. Uh, how will you be sharing the drafts? Uh, I recommend um, Microsoft Office is uh, Office 365, I think is what they call it. And that's sort of like their version of Google. Drive, so everybody just goes to the same document online and it's updated in real time. Uh, that's preferable to me than just emailing drafts back and forth. Uh, yeah, because you can run into a problem where they're either somebody's working from an old draft or maybe it's not even the right file. <laughs> uh, sometimes people just say uh, they save a document and it's just called document, document one. People don't even know what that is. Now, if the quality is crucial, they say have the best writer compose after other people gather data. Let's so you might have a situation where uh, one of the persons are really good at the writing, but uh, <laughs> you don't want them to have to do everything, right? Um, and these other people might be really good at using databases or doing the surveys or uh, basically just doing the other stuff. So the person doing the writing will be free, uh, freed up uh, to, to focus more on that part of it. And then the revising step, so this is after you have your rough draft complete. And then everybody looks over it, evaluates it, you're looking at the content. Uh, but the key there, again, is to decide this as a team, right? So if you, if, if, one, if, if you feel like it's good enough, that's fine. But does the team feel like it's good enough, right? So you have to have a consensus on issues like that. Uh, is it well organized? Uh, are there major revisions that need to be made to it. And then uh, recognizing that different people favor different writing styles. You know, I find this all the time, even amongst uh, my colleagues, other English professors, uh, sometimes we'll look at the same essay and maybe one professor says, that's really great. I would give that an A. Uh, another professor might say, I don't like it. I would give, it, I would give that a, a C. And it's just because they, they favor different writing styles. Maybe one of them thinks it should be more formal. Uh, the other person's okay with less formality. So the point here is that there's not just one universal, one-size-fits-all, perfect writing style. Uh, people have their 
preferences and their uh, little pet peeves, I guess. You just want to keep that in mind. And, and you have your own little pet peeves, too, even if you're not necessarily aware of them. Uh, and again, when you're satisfied, uh, have that, you know, the best writer, uh, go back over it, uh, make it uniform, make it consistent. Editing and proofreading is a, yet another stage. So let's just say you've, you've got the rough draft, you've edited it. It's as good as you can get it. You know, all the big, all the heavy lifting's done, right? And so now it's just a matter of going through it line by line, looking for punctuation errors, grammar errors, that sort of thing. Uh, formatting issues, you know, is everything, if you have subheadings, are those consistent or the parallel? And of course, is it correct? Use a spell checker to do that. Or you could hire a professional proofreader. Let's see, team making the team process work. <laughs> so, all right, so just to wrap up here with a few general points on this then. Uh, so the main thing is to allow ample time to discuss problems and find solutions. So you'll find a lot of times with a student project, a group project in school, usually the big problem is they wait till the last minute. Nobody's done anything until like a week or a day before it's due, and it's a disaster. Uh, the teams that work really well, uh, they don't wait till the last minute. They make sure that they have, uh, they put aside enough regularly uh, scheduled meetings to give them, everybody's got plenty of time. And if it's, it's better to get it done early uh, than it is to uh, turn it in late, right? And they also get to know their team members well. Uh, they've, they've had, again, they've had enough meetings where they've had enough discussions. They, they've got a good feel for each other. And uh, that'll go a long ways. And then attending all the meetings and carrying out all of your duties, you know, this is always important. Uh, people like to uh, wag their finger and, and somebody else on the team, but, you know, did you attend all the meetings and did, did you do everything you were supposed to do? Uh, obviously, that needs to get done. All right, and here we are. Let's wrap it up uh, with a couple last thoughts on this. Uh, note that people have different ways of expressing themselves. Uh, we've talked, been talking about this for a while now, This, especially the idea of uh, communi communicating across cultures. And maybe somebody, you feel like they're disrespecting you, but maybe they're not. Maybe they're just expressing themselves in a different way. Uh, just be aware of that. Uh, don't assume that smooth discussion means total agreement. Uh, again, sometimes people just want to get along. And they're, maybe deep down they disagree, but they're just too nervous about disagreeing with you. Uh, so that can be a factor. Ideally, you want to hear all the opinions. You don't want anybody to feel nervous or uh, not be willing to share their opinion with you or be honest with you. And then uh, using those collaborative technologies, they can be so helpful. I know a lot of people don't like it. You know, they say, I don't want to have to use Skype. I don't know what Skype is. I've never used it. I just want to do things the way I've always done. Well, you know, it's time to kind of uh, expand. <laughs> <laughs> you know, grow out of that. Uh, I love experimenting with these things. Yeah, I probably didn't like Skype the first time I ever used it. Uh, but once I got, once I learned how to use it, I find it really uh, helpful. I, I use it a lot. Same thing with Google Docs. You know, first time somebody showed that to me, I said, well, why would you use that? You know, Microsoft Word, I, I feel good about Word. I know how to use Word. Uh, I don't want to have to use a different word processor. Uh, but really that once I figured out how to use the collaborative side of that Google document and the fact that I could have two or three people from different areas all working on it together online in real time, I mean, it really was extremely useful. Uh, so, yeah, just take the time, learn these technologies, and they will really benefit you. Allow plenty enough time for all stages. So, again, not just the planning. You want to have sufficient time to plan it, to compose it. To revise it and then also to proofread it because remember that proofreading phase won't be effective if you try to do it right after you're done you, know, you need a couple of days at least for that to sit uh, so you can look at it with some fresh eyes and you'll catch a lot more errors that way <laughs>